Amanda from South Africa. The questions I have um, are pertaining to some of the developments each of you have made in terms of um, your research. What is it shifting in terms of policy specifically and the, the impact on the community that it's, it's having on? Because it's, it's great to hear what is emerging from, from those that are, I wouldn't say slightly older than me, but um, from those that are considered young leaders, what exactly is your develop, are your developments and your research, what policy is it shifting and what's the impact of that shift and what is your trajectory and your sustainability in changing that policy? Thank you. Suggest we take a few questions and then uh, you decide uh, on which one you want to go. Yes. My name, <clears throat> pardon me, my name is James Stewart. I currently work for the government of Canada. We have a room here full of uh, industry leaders, government leaders, and I, I just ask the panel, if you think about your current situation and your, your desire for growth and, and how you look to, to drive the, the, the good work that you're doing, what's the one thing, specifically, one thing that you would put in, in the ear of the leaders here who, who manage and drive the behemoths of the world, that when they run into small organizations or they run into startups or run into organizations like your own, what's that one thing you want them to remember? Uh, whether it's to forget about risk aversion or, or something else. I'd be very interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you. Hi, I'm uh, Manu. I'm an engineer from India. I have a question for Aurelion. Uh, so when we speak of cybersecurity in, in uh, the EU, now I have a feeling that unless we resolve some of the larger geopolitical issues, we will never have that because it's an escalating war just being played out in different uh, ambits. So uh, I am just curious about your take on that because uh, it's not only a question of defending ourselves using the tools of technology, but to break the will of the opponent. So I'm maybe referring to Russia and what's been happening of late. But uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering if there needs to be a more comprehensive approach when we speak of security, cybersecurity in, con in, uh, in concrete. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Another question? No. Not now, uh, I suggest uh, we'll take cybersecurity at the end. It's more specialized. But uh, views from the panel uh, shift in policies and impact on communities. And I think communities, uh, it's really one of the foundation of this new economy. We create a lot of communities. We grow people through communities. There is less hierarchy. So what are your takes? Who wants to give it the first go? Nathalie. Thank you very much for the question. So in, in terms of shifting policies, uh, the one that we see most often is around data and, and how data has to be handled. We've seen a big uh, change with the EU legislation around data. Um, so it, where there are policies, they tend to be around data person, uh, and largely around personally identifiable information. What's challenging for a company like mine is that every country has different legislation about how that has to be treated. Uh, we're working across four continents, including in South Africa, where we're launching in eight weeks. Um, so, so it makes it very complicated when, when we're working at the scale that we are. So would love for there to be a global body that takes that on and really makes it easier for small companies. Um, and then to the question around what, what would I love to put in the, in the ear of of the people who I have the privilege of sitting in front of today. Um, if there's one thing that I underestimated in starting this process, it's the power of partnerships between large organizations and small organizations. Um, we've built really effective partnerships with banks, and they obviously bring a lot to the table that we absolutely could not bring to the table, scale operation capacity, risk management, huge, huge customer base. But we're also able to offer something that's difficult for, for banks to do at a large scale, which is to innovate. And um, with our bank customers, we are very close with them. We you know, are in offices between them each other. And it's been a really cost-effective way for them to bring in innovation responsibly. And I think that that's going to be a model that's effective across all kinds of different industries, including government, as we go forward. Because when you're a very large organization, it's just hard to keep up with technology. Thank you. Another view on these two questions. Okay, go ahead. So on the, I really like the question of this one thing to, uh, to, 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 to ask, and, and, and it's going to be an obvious one. I, uh, people say a lot that entrepreneurship is about risk taking. Uh, I disagree, and coming from a scientific background, I think it's just about experiment. So my advice is really don't be afraid to experiment. 
but in everything, like in your business, in your daily life. It can be starting a small project you think is stupid and will never work. It can be downloading Zombie Run when you leave this uh, place. So really, don't be afraid to experiment. And if it doesn't work, just kill it, but kill it fast. That's the... Thank you. One point um, on this question as well. Um, my, my job when I see uh, CEOs of uh, retailers, big companies, um, I do two things. The first thing that I do is I, stop, I start by showing their own numbers. And the, the guy's like, oh, how do, you, how do you know my numbers? And I explain it to them, and then I tell them that I've got, I've got the competitor's data as well, and this is how we do business. But the second thing I tell him is, um, is that w when I was, I mean, not a kid, but when I was in 2003, I was dreaming of being at uh, Lehman Brothers. I was uh, using taxis, I was buying my PS4, at uh, the local store, I was, um, was on Facebook, and every kid was on Facebook. Now, each of these things have just changed in a matter of uh, 10 years, and, and some of them have even changed in a matter of four years. And, and, um, and most of the CEOs with which we discuss, uh, all the discussion end with, there is the probability of your business not being Uberized or totally transformed is absolutely zero unless if you uberize yourself. And I've got just one example, one company who uberized, in a way, itself, which is Indigo. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Indigo. Indigo is the leader in parking uh, in the world. It's the former uh, Vinci. And those guys have been super courageous because they have decided to create a small startup called OpenGo. And OpenGo is the uber of parking lots. So basically, you, you, you choose a parking space. In a minute, you have the location. You go, boom. You don't need to, uh, to do anything else. Your um, uh, license, your number is, is, is recognized and something. And this is the only company that I know that has made such an effort to avoid being challenged by the new economy. So that, that would be the, alarm, the uh, warning, I would say, to any CEO. Alan, a comment? Uh, regarding the uh, first question uh, about shifting on policies, I would say, uh, since like uh, we've been working with the governments in the different countries, also different continents, yeah, of course some governments, they tend to change because they see the impact, how impactful it can be, for example, in our own case, that uh, how, how much money we can save uh, for them, and on the other hand side, how uh, impactful it can be, uh, this project for them. So uh, they, are, they tend basically to, to change the policies, and uh, in the long run, of course, it will be sustainable. But on the other hand side, there would be uh, the countries that uh, they are very, very conservative, and it takes some time. And uh, when it comes for, for uh, a word uh, that remains here, I would just say, do what you love and never give up, because this is the only thing that can uh, be sustainable in long run. I mean, uh, I was reading an article that recently the, there was a research uh, in U.S. that the majority of people that they don't like what they're doing. And I mean, I'm very surprised. I, I usually ask this question from the people that, do you love what you're doing? And they say at the first sentence, yeah, we love it. And when you ask, what is your dream job? They will say something else. So this is not what you, you love. And the only thing that I would say that do what you love and never give up, because this is the only thing uh, that can bring Absolutely. you happiness. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Maybe to react on, on uh, the first question on uh, policy shifting, I see uh, I mean, a tendency to go from national policies to European policies, at least in, the, in this field. We see some countries uh, used to be very uh, protective uh, on these issues, and I'm thinking, of course, of, uh, of France, other to be more open. But there is this feeling that the fragmentation of uh, uh, national markets is, is uh, in itself harmful for the industry and that we have a, an incentive to gain an edge in uh, standardization and at the same time to have a, a collective response to, this, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the personal data, et cetera, issues. On Manu's question on cybersecurity, I will leave the floor to, uh, to, to Patrick. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's not... It's it's different area your question on cybersecurity because uh, you 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 have to start with the threat as I mentioned briefly and threat is first it's permanent it comes from very different horizon is it uh, national military or non-military you have more or less organized crime uh, as a threat 
you have what I call the libertarian hackers, uh, the anonymous type, and you have the sheer incompetence of everybody, uh, me included, uh, that do mistakes that generate uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Uh, so in this context, uh, your, your response is diverse today. Uh, and as I answered the question yesterday, there is an arms race on the technology, but then you, you, you have to know what, what is it that you want to defend. There will be never, as in any other uh, such similar situation before cyber uh, warfare, uh, a no-risk situation. So you have, so there, there is, we are still, what it creates uh, in, uh, is that uh, the corporate world is involved into it. It's not only, uh, we call it uh, in military terms, uh, asymmetric warfare. And we, uh, cyber security is a typical example of, a cyber se of a, an asymmetric type of warfare where a small entity can challenge a much larger organization and create disproportionate uh, impact. And corporations are involved into this uh, cybersecurity question, like it or not, because we are the vehicle, we are the means through our networks, through the technology that we have deployed, and we are part of this, but from different angles. So that's, uh, there is no structured answer so far. There is a, a lot of coordination be between the, the different institutions, and it's new for the corporate world to be involved in, uh, in uh, such activities as it was not the case before. But uh, yes, we will have to organize a response, uh, first an industry response when it comes to the enterprise world, and then uh, connect with the different agencies. So that's for cybersecurity. If there are not uh, other questions, oh, yes, two, yes. Hello, thank you very much for your speeches. So I'm Hermine Durand from France. I have a question for Alan. Uh, I would like to know how it works because uh, I'm quite curious to know um, uh, how you bring the data together and why it hadn't been uh, done before. And can you apply your method to other diseases? What are your next projects? Thank you. Thank you. So Alan, it's direct, so go ahead. Should I answer directly? Yes, yes. Wait? Okay. Uh, basically, like the, the core of the technology is like we have developed a software. And the software, we have different categories of parameter. One is the demographic data, which is like about how old you are, are you male or female, are you smoking, these type of parameters. The other category will be electrocardiogram or ECG. Some parameters will be extracted from the ECG that will input into that, system, uh, into that category, and the other category will be a normal blood test. So this system, the user of the system will be the healthcare professionals, like the doctors or cardiologists or nurses. And so they use it uh, at the primary care that they can understand, for example, if there is a need to do the angiography operation or no. Because at two, today, angiography is the gold standard when they want to see and make sure if, for example, one of the main arteries of the heart is blocked or no. And uh, the point is that uh, why it hadn't been done before, actually, the point is about that this is the emergence of artificial intelligence. I mean, the data is there. It's the, the way that we handle this data. And today, when we go to doctor, they basically, they use the, the man's intelligence. They, they want to correlate this data in their brain. But a human's brain is limited. I mean, the, 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 most strong, the strongest brain can maybe uh, correlate 10 to 20 different parameters. But we look at about 50 different parameters. So in this direction, we can come up with the more accurate results. Thank you. Another question? Sorry. Yeah. The other oh, and about the other diseases, sorry. Okay. Uh, well, basically, we have built the foundation that can be used for the complex diseases. But the main focus at the moment is heart disease, because heart disease is the number one cause of this all around the world. And about 17.5 million people die every year in the world just because of heart disease. Of course, uh, in, the, in the long run, we have the plan that we extend it to other complex diseases like cancer. Yeah. OK, yeah, please. Uh, hi, my name is Estelle Yusufa. I'm a journalist. I wanted to um, 
ask the panel their thoughts on uh, what I see as a tension uh, regarding this new digital era, as in the data that you're talking about is a commodity for business, whereas for government it's statistics, i.e. for some it's uh, money to be made, for others is the obligation to pr protect privacy, anonymity, and I don't know the term in English, but in French that would be the right to be forgotten as in when I'm listening to the health applications that you're talking about, uh, as a cancer survivor, I would be very scared that those data would be used by my insurers, as in paying a premium. So I would think that that's one tension, but what I would, our colleague from the European Union mentioned uh, the tax evasion. In a way, business corporations are expecting uh, that uh, leads to what you mentioned about cyber security. I'm expecting governments to step in in terms of ensuring security, but are they paying the price of the accountability that Edouard mentioned? Um, corporations are trying to pay less and less taxes and being less and less accountable for a field where they almost have total monopoly. So I would have to have um, the thoughts of the panel on that. Okay, so this. Uh, first, uh, I guess I would uh, first respond by, uh, to your question by a question, which is that, uh, I mean, uh, Montaigne used to say that uh, science sans conscience uh, n'est que ruine de l'âme, so uh, uh, science without maybe ethics. So, pardon? Rabelais? Pardon. <laughs> okay, go ahead. At the senior to tender. Anyway, th so there is a trade off between. Uh, science and ethics, or science without uh, ethics in, in modern terms uh, doesn't go very far. But what we can see in a globalized world is that you can choose to have lower standards in terms of conscience or ethics to gain an edge on uh, the economy and competitiveness. We, we see that on personal data. Uh, I mean, it's clear that if you give no protection to personal data, uh, it will be very, very much easier to create your business on that and to, to use the data. On the contrary, if you, you, if you put up too strong regulations, uh, it, it is certain that, uh, that uh, the economic opportunities will be more difficult. And this is increased by the fact that uh, as you fight, uh, it, it's not, you don't fight to be uh, better, than, uh, to be better, but you fight to be the best because it's a, it's a platform economy. So in a way, in, in, this, in, in such or such sector, you need to be first. And that's why uh, my uh, question in, in return is more that uh, my interrogation is, uh, I mean, I think that maybe in, uh, in Europe we can, we can reach an agreement on what is the right level of personal data protection. You mentioned the right to be forgotten. I mean, it, 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 it is or will be in, uh, in EU legislation. And uh, so th there will be an EU standard, but there will also be standards in other parts of the world. And this will interact with competitiveness and my preoccupation is where should we discuss this? Is there a place, a way to discuss this given the, the pace of change? Yeah. I'd like yeah. to add two things on, on that point because that's basically the, the heart of my business, saying what is personal <coughs> and what is anonymized data. The first thing that I want to do is to uh, make a compliment to uh, uh, the, um, the public forces, I mean, no, the public, which is um, um, previously all regulations about private data only showed one thing, which is the guy who wrote the laws didn't know much about what it was writing about, or at least it would not, it was not aligned with the state of technology and the the reality of what data was. So, uh, for the first time, GDPR, which is the regulation that has to be uh, enforced by May 2018, it's the first regulation of its kind, which is basically matching in terms of um, expertise and. Uh, and um, the, the, what, what, what we live uh, on, on a daily basis in our uh, businesses. And, and the correlation of having more expertise from the lawmakers is that it creates opportunities for companies like Fox Intelligence, for example, because in GDPR, anonymized data for the first time has been properly described. And we sell anonymized data. So um, my, uh, my take on that is uh, by integrating private sector uh, in the debate, by elevating the level of expertise from the public sector, then we can uh, achieve the kind of things that has been achieved with GDPR. Okay, good. 
I also spend a lot of time thinking about PII versus non-PII, personally identifiable information versus generic information. <clears throat> and a large part of what makes my business defensible is that we have a large amount of non uh, non-personally identifiable information, that data that I'm largely interested in is how you ask your bank, what's my balance, do I have money, can I afford this coffee? That's the data that we, we feed into our model. So <clears throat> from a business standpoint, we're interested in making sure that we can maintain that data and our defensibility. Where it gets interesting is the personally identifiable information. And um, <clears throat> you've, you've got an example where you would be hesitant to have your healthcare information available. I have an example where I actually really wanted my healthcare information to be available. Um, I lived in multiple countries, I kept moving, and every time I moved, they refused to release my health records. So now I don't know what my, my past is, so I've been negatively impacted by that. And I think that this fundamental tension is gonna work itself out um, because one of the promises of AI is a level of personalization that we've never seen before. So where consumers can drive value from their data from different businesses, they're gonna want it to be available. And I think that the logical consequence of that is that um, increasingly, policies are going to have to find ways to give each individual user the autonomy to say where and how they want their data used. How that's actually managed and handled will definitely take time. It will also take a lot of technology to manage that. But we're going to see uh, a personalization in terms of people getting to choose in a very granular, granular way who and where their data can be used. So, yeah, I would like to add one point from the enterprise perspective. Uh, in fact, it's our entire society that was mechanical process centric. I mean, uh, processes is something from the 50s, 60s. It's been developed and our society was organized around processes. With what you just heard, we, we completely shift towards a knowledge data centric type of organization. So it rocks the entire enterprise. It, it, you, 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 you are constantly, it's a big challenge, but it's a challenge for society as well. You are constantly rebuilding the way you operate. And, and the, the, one of the big challenges that large corporations have today is how do you keep it together? Because the tensions are coming from everywhere. If I, I was discussing with the chairman of the large insurance company uh, in the US, and he was explaining to me, looking at his value chain, just to illustrate my point, on the back in the refinancing, I'm attacked by the fintech, not the kind of uh, Natalie, but uh, other type of fintech. On the, on the front, I'm attacked by the type of Google. In the middle, in risk management, there are all the uh, algorithm developers that are playing with this. Uh, I have already uh, subcontracting my underwriting uh, activities. So what am I left? What makes the value? And we speak of a, of a complete activity uh, that is a significant activity in our world that is insurance. And, and that's the reality. And then the discussion we had is, okay, how can we maintain, because the value is maintaining this value chain together. And then he said, okay, how can you interoperate with me, so, which for us is a complete new world of engaging with, with our clients. And so we are all here uh, discovering. And in terms of policy and responsibility, because you're right, it's an important point, uh, there is, an, beyond GDPR, there is another European directive called NIS, Network and Information Systems, that come into law uh, in May, that defines the responsibilities, what uh, notably between uh, operators, service providers, uh, uh, enterprise, who is in charge of main maintaining what. And if you fail, uh, it's like for GDPR, the fine is up to 4% of your revenue, which is a big amount of money for anybody, whatever your size is. So this is a first attempt. But the fundamentally, we, we all have to rethink the way we operate. And so we don't have all the answers today. Other questions? If not, I thank you very much. Yeah. Do you mind if I just add one thing that I, or if it, if you no, go ahead, conclude. Okay, if you, uh, getting back to your question, James, uh, one thing that makes for me the difference of uh, most of the companies that I've seen as uh, potential clients and the startups that I see is that there is a hidden principle in every startup that I don't see in every big company. And this hidden principle is you always hire people that are better than yourself. Uh, who have at least one thing that he does, where he has more talent than yourself. And the opposite is what you see in many companies. You take somebody who's not gonna be challenging you, who sometimes, let's say in political party, would be able to do things that you don't want to do. And the consequences of that, in, after 20, 30 years, 
is you end up with the GOP in the US, the Republican Party, which is basically if you always hire somebody who is just a little bit talented than yourself, then you just take one generation, boom, you're gone. And, and, and the difference with startups, since we don't have that much money to hire people, we always make uh, the effort to choose um, somebody who has something to bring to the company. And that would be what I'd like to leave in the ears of a, of a CEO today. Thank you. So thank you for uh, your participation. And I hope uh, we can bring a new light. Thank you very much.